This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 20 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges of the Tide Pod Podcast. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman Part 2, Chapter 13, Judas Hey there, sporty. My assistant greets me in the shop. Stand treat on this festive occasion. Yes, Red, have a chew, I reply with a smile, handing him my fresh plug of tobacco. His eyes twinkle with mischievous humor as he scrutinizes my changed suit of dark gray. The larger part of the plug swelling out his cheek, he flings to me the remnant across the table, remarking, Don't care for it. Take back your chew. I'll keep my honor. Your plug, I mean, Sonny. A gentleman of my eminence, sir, a natural-born navigator on the high seas of social life. Are you on me by? A gentleman, I repeat, sir, whose canoe the mutations of all that is human have chucked on this dry, thrice dram dry latitude, sir. This noxious plague spot of civilization. Say, kid, what the hell am I talking about? Damn if I ain't clean for God. I'm sure I don't know, Red. Like hell you don't. It's your glad duds, kid, offering me a chew of tobacco. Christ, I'm dying for a drop of booze. This magnificent occasion deserves a wedding, sir. And say, Alec, it won't hurt your beauty to stretch them sleeves of yours a bit. You look like a scarecrow in them high-water pants. Ain't old Sandy the kin of Skinner's, though. Whom do you mean, Red? Who I mean, you idiot, but that skunk of a warden, the Honorable Captain Edward S. Wright. If you please, sir, captain of old rotten old punks. That's what he is. You ask the screws. He's never smelt powder. Why, he's been here most of his life. But some of the screws been here longer, born here, damn him. Couldn't pull him out of there with those steam engine you couldn't. They can tell you all about the captain, though. Old Sandy didn't have a plugged nickel to his name when you come here. Now the damn stomach robber is rich. Regular gold mine this dump for him. He only gets lousy five thousand per year. Got big family and keeps carriages and servants. See, and I can't afford to go to Europe every year. And got a pile in the bank to boot. All the scurvy five thousand a year. Good manager, ain't he? A regular church member, too. Damn his rotten soul to hell. Is he as bad as all that, Red? Is he? Epicure died in the wool, that's what he is. Played the humanitarian racket. He had a great deal to say in the papers. That's why I didn't believe the brutal way Zimes was punished by the Homestead Colonel. Or, uh, what's his name? Colonel Streeter of the 10th Pennsylvania. That's the cur. He hung up Private Imes by the thumbs till the poor little boy was almost dead. For nothing, too. Suppose you remember, don't you? Imes had called for three cheers for the man who shot Frick, and they pretty near killed him for it, and then drummed him out of the regiment with his head half-shaved. It was a most barbarous thing. And that damn Sandy swore in the papers he didn't believe in such things. And all the while the lion murderer is doing it himself. Not a day but some poor con is cuffed up in the hole. That's the kind of humanitarian he is. It makes me wild to think on it. Why, kid, I even get a big excited and forget that you, young sir, are attuned to the dulcet symphonies of classic English. But whenever that skunk of a warden is the subject of conversation, sir, even my usually impertrunable serenity of spirit and tranquil stoicism are not equal to patience on a monument smile at grief. Watch me, Sonny. That's yours truly spilin'. Why, look at them dingy rags of yours. I like you better in the striped duds. They give you the hand-me-downs of that nigger that went out yesterday and changed you the books with a brand new suit. See where Sandy gets his slice, eh? And say, kid, how long are you here? About eight months, Red. They beat you out of two months, all right. Suppose they obey their own rules. Nitzer, you are aware, my pleasure slam, that you are entitled to discard your polychromic vestments of zebra hue after your sojourn of six months in the benevolent dump. I bet that fresh fish at the looping machine there came up here some days ago. He won't be kept waiting more than six months for his black clothes. I glance in the direction of the recent arrival. He is a slender man with swarthy complexion and quick-shifting eye. The expression of guilty cunning is repelling. Who is that man? I whisper to the assistant. Like him, don't you? Permit me, sir, to introduce you to the handiwork of his maker, 
a mealy mouth, thoy lipped, scurvy gay cat, a yellow cur, a sniveling, fawning stool, a filthy oozy sneak, a snake in the grass whose very presence, sir, is a mortal insult to a self respecting member of my clan, Mr. Patrick Gallagher, of the Honorable Pinkerton family, sir. Gallagher, I ask in astonishment. The informer who denounced Dempsey and Beattie? The very same. The dirty snitch that got those fellows railroaded here for seven years. Dempsey was a fool to bunch up with such a vermin as Gallagher and Davison. He was master workman of some district of the night's labor. Why in hell didn't he get his own men to do the job? Goes to work and hires a brace of gay cats. Sends him to the scab mills, you scabby. A sling hash for the blacklegs. And keep him posted on the goings-on, see? Suppose you have oriented yourself, sir, concerning the developments in the culinary experiment. Yes, croton oil is supposed to have been used to make the scab sick with diarrhea. Make him sick? Why, me by scores of him croaked. I am surprised, sir, to use such a vulgar term as diarrhea. You offend my aestheticism. The learned gentleman who delved deeply into the bowels of the earth and man, sir, ascribed the sudden and phenomenal increase of unmentionable human obligations to nature. The mysterious and extravagant popularity of the houses of ill odor, sir, the automatic obedience to their call, as due entirely to the dumping of a lot of old lousy bums, sir, into filthy quarters or to impurities of the liquid supply, or to, pardon my frankness, sir, to intestinal effeminacy, which in flaccid excitability persisted in ill-timed relaxation, unseemly and well-mannered Christians. Some future day, sir, they may well arise a poet to glorify with beauteous epic the heroic days of the modern bull run. And I can tell you, laddie, they run and kept running top and bottom, or some lyric bard may put the to a hudiberistic verse. Watch me climb the uh, Parnassus, kid. The poetic feet, the numbers, the assonance, the strain of the inspiring days when Croton Oil was king. Yes, sir, re. But for yours truly, me hand in such pies. And moreover, sir, I make it an invariable rule of gentlemanly behavior to keep my snout out of other people's biz. Dempsey may be innocent, Red. Well, the jury don't think so, but there's no telling, honest to God. I like that round scab of a Gallagher has the cast pale hue of a resolution. If I may borrow old Billy Shake's slang, sir, over me generally settled convictions, you know in the abundant plentitude of my heterogeneous experience with the sorts of conditions of rats and gay cats, sir, fortified by a natural genius of no mean order of 1859 vintage, damn if I ever run across such an acute form of confessionist as may infested by the loud of the looping machine here, you know what he done yesterday? What? Sent for the district attorney and made another confess. Really? How do you know? Night screws a partner friend of mine, kid. I stands, you see. The mixer regular Yahoo can hardly spell his own name. He daily requisitions upon my humble but abundant intelligence, sir, to make out his reports. Catch on, eh? I've never earned a handout with more dignified probity, sir. It's a cinch. Last night he gave me a great slice of corn dodger. It was A1, I tell you and two hard-boiled eggs, and half a tomato, juicy and luscious, sir. Didn't I enjoy it, though? Make your mouth water, eh, kid? Well, if you be good time, and you have can of what I got, I'll divvy up with you. Well, don't stand there and gape at me like a wooden engine, as the unexpected revelation of my magnanimous generosity deprived you of your articulate utterance, sir. The sly wink with which he emphasizes the offer, and his sudden serious manner, affect me unpleasantly. With pretended indifference, I declined to share his delicacies. You need those little extras for yourself, Red, I explain. You told me you suffer from indigestion. A change of diet now and then will do you good. But you haven't finished telling me about the new confession of Gallagher. Oh, you're a sly one, Alec. No flies on you. But it's all right. Me by, maybe. I can do something for you some day. I'm your friend, Alec. Count on me. But that mud of a Gallagher, yes sir, re made another confession. Damn, if it ain't a stirred one. Ever hear such a thing? I got a straight from the screw, all right. I can't take the damn snitch out. Undeservedly, I vow, sir, that an incomprehensible vacillations of the honorable gentleman puzzle me noodle, and are calculated to disturb the repose of a right-thinking yag in the silken reap of Morpheus. What is game, anyhow? Shall we diagnose the peculiar mental menstruation as a, uh, uh, or what's your learned opinion? My illustrations, colleague, eh? What you grinning for, Foraz? It's a serious matter, sir. A highly instructive phenomenon of intellectual vacuity, impregnated with the pernicious virus of Pinkerstonism, sir, and transmuted in the alembic of a carnage alchemy, a judicious injection of uh, persuasive gems by the sagacious uh, journal consuls of the house of Dempsey, and lo, 
Three brand new confessions, mutually contradictory and exclusive. Does that strike you in the spot, Sonny? In the second confession, he retracted his accusations against Dempsey. What's the third about Red? Retract his attraction me by. Guess why, Alec? I suppose he was paid to reaffirm his original charges. You're not far off. After that beauty of a Judas cleared the man, Sandy noted Reed and Docs. Damn smart guys, all right. The attorneys of the Carnegie Company to interpret Madame Justica, sir, in a manner. I know, Red, I interrupt him. They are lawyers who prosecuted me. Even in court, they were giving directions to the district attorney and openly whispering to him questions to be asked the witnesses. He was just a figurehead and a tool for them, and it sounded so ridiculous when he told the jury that he was not in the service of any individual or corporation, but that he acted solely as an officer of the Commonwealth, charged with the sacred duty of protecting its interests in my prosecution. And all the time, he was the mouthpiece of Frick's lawyers. Hold on, kid. I don't get a chance to squeeze a word in edgewise when you start, John. Think you're on the platform, hard grang, honk haired crowd? You can't convert me, so save your breath, man. I shouldn't want to convert you, Red. You are intelligent, but a hopeless case. You are not the kind that could be useful to the cause. Glad you're next. Got me sized up, all right, eh? Well, me saintly by. I'm Johnny on the spot to serve the cause, all right, all right, and the cause is me with a big M, see? A fellow foot and not in a look for the number one. I give it to you straight, Alec. What's them high-flown notions of yours, oppressed humanity, and suffering people fiddlesticks? There you go and shove your damn neck into the noose for the strikers. What have them fellows ever done for you, eh? Tell me that. They don't do a darn thing for you. Catch me swinging for the peel pole. The cattle don't deserve any better than they get, that's what I say. I don't want to discuss these questions with you, Red. You'll never understand anyhow. Get off now, you voice a sentiment, sir, that my adequate appreciation of myself will prompt me to resent to the field of honor, sir. But the unworthy spirit of acrobuity is totally foreign to my nature, sir. And I shall preserve the blessed meekness of so becoming the true Christian, and shall follow the bidding of my master, my humbly offering of the other cheek, for the chaw of the weed I gave you. Dig down into your poke, kid. I hand him the remnant of my tobacco, remarking, You've lost the thread of our conversation as usual, Red. You said the warden sent for the Carnegie lawyers after Gallagher had recounted his original confession. Well, what did they do? Don't know what they done, but I told you that that Martin had sent for the district attorney the same day and signed a third confession, while Dempsey was tickled to death of the cause. He seizes abruptly. His quick short coughs warn me of danger, accompanied by the deputy of the shop officer. The warden is making the rounds of the machines, pausing here and there to examine the work and listen to the request of a prisoner. The youthfully sparkling eyes of a striking contrast to the sedate manner and seemed features framed in grayish white. Approaching the table, he greets us with a benign smile. Good morning, boys. Casting a glance at my assistant, the warden inquires. Your time must be up soon, Red. Been out and back again, Captain, the officer laughs. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Back home, the thin feminine accents of the deputy sound sarcastic. Didn't like it outside, Red, the warden sneers. A flush darkens the face of the assistant. There's more skunks out there than him, he retorts. The captain frowns. The deputy lifts a warning finger, but the warden laughs slightly and continues on his rounds. We work in silence for a while. Red looks restive. His eyes stealthily follow the departing official. Presently, he whispers, See me handed in to him, Alex? He knows I'm on to him, all right. Didn't he look mad enough, though? Thought he'd burst. Sobered him up a bit. Pipe his lamps, kid. Yes, very bright eyes. Bright eyes, your grandmother. Dope, that's what the matter is. Think I'd get off as easy if it wasn't chuck full of this stuff? I know it ain't the minute I laid my eyes on him. I can tell by the shining glimmers and the slick smile of his when he's feeling good. Know the signals, all right. Always feeling fine when he's hit the pipe. That's the time you can get anything you want from him. Next time you see that spark on him, hit him for something. He'll hand it to you right there. He's going down to the socks first thing you know. Yes, we need more help. Why don't you ask him? Me? Me ask a favor of the damn swine? Not of your tiny type. You don't catch me with a vouchsafe the high and mighty, sir, the opportunity. All right, Red. I won't ask him either. I don't give a damn. For I care, Alex, and well confidently speaking, sir, there might in course this presence hoisery and the infound barrel and dehinence of the nibs, which is, of course, if I may venture my humble opinion, young sir, sufficiently generous in his expansiveness, to regard the rugicity of his stocking turned inside out, sir. Do you follow the argument, me by? 
With the difficulty read, I reply with a smile. What are you really talking about? I do wish you'd speak plainer. You do, do ya? And maybe you don't. Got to the train, you rag gradual, so to speak. It's so many duties of pushing. We's gotta get out and help, you see. I, I ain't gonna kill myself working here like a nigga. I'll, I'll quit first. Do, do you think s s The shop officer is returning. Damn your imprudence, Red, he shouts at the assistant. Why don't you keep that tongue of yours in check? Why, Mr. Carson, what's the trouble? You know damn well what's the trouble. You made the old man mad clean enough. You ought to know better than that. He was nice as pie till he opened that big trap of yours. Everything went wrong then. You gave me the dickens about that pile you got lying round here. Why don't you take over the roopers, Burke? They have not been turned yet, I reply. What do you say? Not turned, he bristles. What in the hell you fellas doing, I'd like to know. We're doing more than we should, Red retorts defiantly. Shut up now and get a move on, you. On that rotten grub they feed us, the assistant persists. You better shut up, Red. Then give us some help. I will like hell. The whistle sounds the dinner hour. End of section 20. Recording by Anthony Gerges of the Tide Pod Podcast. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.